Stay tuned, you're watching a local spotlight of SNS Cycle Incorporated. So we're going out on a service call here. It's not a service call. <laughs> going on on a route. Funny, the name Second Nature has double meanings in that, you know, it's always been Second Nature. We've had this kind of gift to be able to pick a product that people like. And it's tying two economies and it's not, you know, and it's hard because you, you, we don't grow ginger here in Viroqua, Wisconsin, but we do grow honey. It's important for our community to know that 90% of the seeds that we had available to us when we came to this country are now extinct. We reach for minimal packaging just because of my personal ideals. I prefer less waste. Our community really came through and that's the only reason we're here. Where you saw what this area looks like and then like all of a sudden you turn a corner and here's this major industrial complex. It's like, where did this come from? You know, well, it's been here since 1969. In the heart of the Driftless region located southeast of Viola, you'll find the major industrial complex, SNS Cycle, all on this logo spotlight. SNS has a lot of history. We started in 1958, and we're going to take a tour of the museum here. First of all, we'll show you where we've been, and then we're going to go out in the plant and show you what we're doing now. Currently, SNS has about 230 employees. Uh, at one time, um, during the boom years, we had as many as 430, but in 2008, the, um, the market crash hit us hard because we are not making something that you actually need. It's a luxury item, it's a toy, uh, so we suffered some very severe layoffs, uh, but we're still here and we're building it back up. Uh, we have uh, not only expanded our core market product, uh, but we're also, obviously we have a lot of machining capacity here with our CNC machining centers. We're actually doing custom machining for different companies and we'll, we'll see that when we go out on the plant. One of our biggest customers is Kawasaki. Uh, we make lawnmower engines crankcases for them and that that's the only department that actually runs 24 7 right now is the Kawasaki line. So let's talk about this stuff here. Okay this is a picture of George J. Smith um, one of the founders of SNS Cycle and you can see uh, these different pictures he's standing by a motorcycle and this is a reproduction of, of that motorcycle it's a knucklehead with two carburetors. That was George's big thing was carburetors. And he understood that in order to get more power out of an engine, you have to get more air into it. And people go, air, why do you need air? Isn't it the fuel that makes the power? Well, yeah, it is. But you need air to burn fuel. So the two have to go together. If you want to get more fuel, uh, more air, bigger explosions in that cylinder, more power down the road. So this thing has two uh, carburetors. He ran this on alcohol. Back in 1952, when these pictures were taken, he won the Midwest Drag Championship at the halfway drag strip in Blue Island, Illinois. And this thing was doing about 130 miles an hour in a quarter, and it beat everybody. Now back then, you didn't have the classes like you do today. Uh, whoever pulled up beside you at the drag strip, that's who you uh, we're racing with. It could be a car, it could be a motorcycle, it could be whatever. Here's a picture of George and his wife Margie and there's the tramp. You notice these big trophies? These are all the trophies he won during that year and they're all in this display case right here. This motorcycle here uh, was George J. Smith's personal ride. Uh, they bought a couple of police bikes back in the 50s. This is a pan head. They gave it the treatment with the two carburetors. If you see this picture here, you see that there's two of these bikes. And they built two bikes that were almost identical. Here's George, and here's his brother-in-law, Merle. And this was in Daytona Beach in 1960. And uh, they drove those bikes down there. Um, here's a picture of somebody <laughs> we don't actually know who this is. Uh, it was just uh, a guy that wanted to have his picture taken on the bike. Uh, but it was a beautiful shot with the ocean because they actually used to race on the beach. You know, driving on the wet sand, you could go really fast. That's uh, what the Daytona uh, 500 is all about. You know, they, it was a, a, a speed haven, you know, kind of like Bonneville, only, you know, people would drive along the beach. This bike here was actually Marjorie's bike. This is a 1966 
um, Harley Davidson FLH. This is a shovel head engine in here. It was the first year of the shovels. And you can see these pictures here. Here's, here's Margie riding on her brother's bike in the early 1940s. Margie was a rider. She was very tech savvy. She knew what she was talking about. And too often, people talk about s and and they talk about George Smith. Okay, George did this, George did that. Well, she was uh, definitely a part of this company and a very important part. She did uh, a lot of work in the shop. She did the office work. She did the um, promotional stuff. She hand-typed letters to every Harley-Davidson dealer in the country to, to get the word out that s and Cycle was available and then they had these products. And that's how it all got started. Here's a photograph of the two original founding members of s and Cycle. George J. Smith and Stanley Stankos. These guys were racing buddies and they actually worked together to build products. Um, there's a story about these guys casting aluminum pistons. Here's one of these pistons here. So they started s and in 1958 and the first product was push rods. And everybody knows s and cycle because of our carburetors and our engines, but push rods were the first product and we still sell push rods today because our push rods are better than the stock push rods. You can always go faster. But about a year after they started, Stanley uh, dropped out of s and Cycle, sold his interest to the Smiths, and uh, so it became, instead of Smith and Stankos, s and it was Smith and Smith because uh, Margie was then a full partner in the business and uh, it went on from there. And they moved to Viola in 1969. They had bought this farm here in the early 60s because they used to go up to Minnesota to do uh, canoeing and fishing. And uh, they loved this country. And when a farm became available here, George came out, took a look at it, bought it on the spot. And then in 1969, they moved out here. And they actually were coming out here to raise beef cattle. Well, we don't have any cattle here now, <laughs> but s and Cycle, the motorcycle business, just kept growing and growing and growing. And now it it dominates this, and there is a Smith Family Farms, but that's a, a, that's a different company now. In the early 1960s, it was very important uh, for s and Cycle to own lathes because they wanted to make flywheels for Harley-Davidson engines. And in order to do that, they needed a lathe. They actually took a second mortgage out on their house to buy this thing. It was that important. And uh, when they got it home, they realized they had no way to get it down in their basement where their shop was. So they took this entire machine apart, fed the pieces down through a basement window and reassembled it. Now we had talked about the, the dual carburetor heads uh, on the tramp and on the, the pan head that was George J. Smith's bike. It was a very uh, laborious process, very labor intensive, uh, and they actually took in heads in the early years and did this modification, but it was really hard, um, just too much labor. So George knew he had to come up with a better way to get air in these motors. And so in, in the early or mid 60s, he actually designed a large single throat carburetor. And that's what started s and on the road being the carburetor people. Now we have a, a set of these heads in the display case here. Um, a guy called us up and said he had found these at a swap meet and would we like to buy them? And we said, well, okay. You know. No, we, we jumped on that really quick because these are, these are S&S history right here. You know, there were only about 30 sets of these made and we felt very fortunate to be able to find a set of these for, our, for the museum. This thing here is one of the first S&S carburetors it's not pretty, but it really did work. And of course it was a racing part, but lots of racing parts find their way onto the street. And that's how s and became as popular because uh, the stock carburetors on Harleys back then were not very good. And the s and carburetors made them run better and faster, you know, just easier to deal with. These are a set of the early flywheels that s and made. These things are made out of um, malleable iron, which is similar to what ductile iron is today. It was a, a very laborious process where these things had to be cast and then heat treated, but they're really, really strong. Um, whereas the stock Harley flywheels are made out of very soft gray iron, these things are very hard, they're very strong. If you're making a lot more horsepower, you need some strong parts. Here's a picture of George actually building carburetors, and I believe this was 
1968, that would have been in Blue Island, Illinois, in their shop there. This here is a blow up of our first advertising brochure, Push Rods, the, the product that, the first product that SNS made. And you might ask, well, why are push rods important? It's a valve train part, and the stock Harley valve train in those days was not built for speed. It, it worked okay uh, driving down the highway, but if you wanted to go fast, the valves would float, which means they don't actually close between one cycle and another um, because the hydraulic uh, system that they had was not very good. So this thing actually replaces the hydraulic lifters. It's a solid lifter conversion kit and lightweight aluminum push rods. Your motor can turn faster, you can make more, more power. And we still sell a ton of push rods today. SNS has been known for a lot of things over the years. Um, obviously we started out with push rods in 1958 when the company was founded, that was the first product. I went on to flywheels, big carburetors. For years and years, SNS was known for carburetors. The Super B carburetor, which was introduced in the 1970s, 1976, I believe, was the standard Harley carburetor for many, many years. And then in the 1990s, we came out with the Super E carburetor, which was shorter, had an accelerator pump, looked prettier, um, and you know, sales just went through the roof. Uh, and we've been selling carburetors ever since. We still sell carburetors, even though there hasn't been a carbureted Harley Davidson motorcycle built since 19 or 2006. Everything is fuel injected now. We also make fuel injected parts. So we're, we're in the fuel delivery business. But in the 1970s, we also in, started to build up a collection of internal engine parts. Uh, running nitro in the drag bikes was bending connecting rods. So SNS came out with very strong connecting rods, flywheels connecting rods. Uh, we could put together a complete lower end uh, then we had big bore cylinders in 1977, or 1976 actually, that's why we call them sidewinders because that was the bicentennial year and that was the Gadsden flag with the don't tread on me snake, so they call them sidewinders. And uh, we sell big bore kits, the very same things that we were selling back then. We still sell them today for shovels and uh, different engines, evolution engines. Uh, but as I mentioned, we uh, in the early 90s, SNS had enough parts to build a complete engine, and that's exactly what we did. If you've got, if you got it, flaunt it, you know. And, but the fact that Harley was not making enough motorcycles left a vacuum in the market. So people were building motorcycles, and they needed an engine. We had it. It was just like, just like marriage made in heaven. It was like you you couldn't fall into a better market than that. But it isn't just a matter of. Um, chance. Uh, SNS products are so high quality. Uh, if you buy an SNS engine, it's not just a production slap together engine. Yeah, it's all in spec, put it together, ship it out. These things are hand fit. Every piston is fit to a cylinder. It's like buying a blueprinted engine. So you're paying more money than if you bought something from Harley Davidson, but it's going to be twice as big. It's going to make twice as much power and the quality is incredible. This is uh, the old ranch sign here, SNS Ranch. That was because they were going to raise cattle here. And in fact, when I started here in 1988, there were cattle out around the grounds here. In fact, in the back, uh, you'd, they'd open up the doors in the summer to get some cool air in there, and the cows would be right there, and they'd stick their heads in the, the shop and look around and say, well, there's nothing to eat here, you know, and so they'd leave. But they were right there, and it was, it was kind of neat. This is the first, I'll use the, the term loosely, Harley Davidson drag bike to go 200 miles an hour in the quarter. Now I say loosely because these rocker covers here are the only Harley Davidson parts on this bike. But it is a V-twin, it is a pushrod engine. This engine has a, a McClure overkill crank in it, which is like automotive, it's a single piece forged crank. Um, the cylinders are offset because it's not like a Harley in that respect. This thing, we estimate that it makes about a thousand horsepower. It's supercharged fuel injected nitromethane. And in order to get something this big to go 200 miles an hour and a quarter, you have to have a lot of power. And now this is a drag slick. It's very wide and it has no tread on it. It has a lot of uh, surface area on the asphalt. 
which is the way you're going to get the power to the ground. So this is, this is the tire that propels this motorcycle. And they only run about 20 pounds of air in these things sometimes because they want them to squish down onto the asphalt and, and take a hold. Okay, this motorcycle here is the Nitro Express. This was, it's an Ironhead Sportster and it runs on nitromethane, which makes a lot of power. Uh, obviously, what we do here at s and is make these things bigger. This is 96 cubic inches and it has set 16 world records at Bonneville. Warner Riley was the, the pilot. We won't call it a rider, it's a pilot. You just hang out of these things and try and go straight. Uh, but he set 16 world records. This thing has gone over 200 miles an hour, got him in the 200 mile an hour club. Now you notice that this tire is smooth. Uh, the reason that for that is, is at Bonneville, as fast as these tires spin, they can't have tread on them or they'll just blow up from centrifugal force. So they're actually shaved. The tires are about that thick. It's a problem because the, the salt at Bonneville is kind of greasy feeling. It's not like asphalt. So traction is a problem. And when you're going 200 miles an hour, the wind resistance is incredible. So uh, horsepower isn't all there is to it out there. Uh, once, you, once you get going really fast, uh, the, the wind resistance becomes a huge factor. This kind of looks like a torpedo or a fish, but it actually is a motorcycle. This is called a streamliner. These are made to go extremely fast in a straight line. This thing looks like a fish, moves like a fish, steers like a cow. It does not turn. Here and look at the luxurious interior of this motorcycle. And I can assure you that I would not fit in here. But the guy who, who piloted this thing is Dan Kinsey. We can see a picture of him. He's the little guy in this picture here. And he is, he's a short, extremely muscular, very brave individual. Uh, because he told me that he never, ever felt in control of this thing when he was riding it. And he made multiple runs on this thing. He actually crashed it at 220 miles an hour one time and got back in it and did it again. So that tells you something. I've heard them described as wind-up monkeys, uh, but, that, but they are generally very you know, small men, very, very strong because these things take some wrestling to make them work. This motorcycle is called Tramp 3. Um, the first Tramp was George J. Smith's drag bike, Knucklehead, and um, there was another Tramp, but this is Tramp 3. This was actually built to test motors for the Streamliner because the Streamliner is extremely difficult to run. Uh, it takes a lot of effort to move this thing around. Uh, this is a motorcycle that's very easy to carry around, very easy to run anywhere but it actually started setting records immediately when they were testing these motors in its own class. So this actually became more of a marketing tool for us because it looks like a motorcycle. You know, people look at that streamliner and they say, okay, you know, it's, it's a special racing machine, but this looks like something somebody might actually drive. So this is Tramp 3. Again, Dan Kinsey was the pilot and uh, he's done amazing speeds with this thing. He's, he's a 200 mile an hour club member, obviously. Um, this bike, the highest record it set was 228 miles an hour, but according to the tachometer, he should have been going 270. He was spinning the tire that much. As I said, these tires are all bald, they're very smooth, and the traction is not very good in, at Bonneville. This bike is called Rattle Trap. This is the first motorcycle to ever run our 160 cubic inch NHRA Pro Stock engine. And it just appeared kind of out of nowhere uh, in 2004, qualified in the top 10. And uh, SNS has been going head to head with Harley Davidson for the last 10 years or so in the NHRA Pro Stock. Um, Vance and Hines team is sponsored by Harley Davidson. And we have won several championships uh, and we think that's pretty cool. We, we always have about five bikes in the top 10, and every once in a while we, we win the championship. And for a small company like SNS to go out there, you know, with our sling and, and slay the giant every once in a while, we think that's great. This trophy over here is a Wally. That is an NHRA trophy. That's, that's what they call them, the Wallies. I believe it's 2007. This is a collection of all the engines that we sell. 
This was the very first complete engine that we sold, or actually that we built. Uh, in the early 90s, we had been making uh, crankshafts and pistons and cylinders and camshafts and all the carburetors. And we finally uh, came up with crank cases and cylinder heads. So, you know, if you put all that stuff together, you've got a fairly complete motor. And as it happened, in those days, in the early 90s, Harley-Davidson was not making enough motorcycles. <clears throat> it would take 18 months to get a, a new big twin. You'd have to put your name on a waiting list and it would finally come in and then you had your motorcycle. So when there is a vacuum in a market like that, someone is going to come in and, and fill that vacuum, entrepreneurial spirit being what it is. And a company called Illusion was the very first to start building aftermarket motorcycles. All the parts were available in the aftermarket to build this thing except for the engine. And guess what we had? We had just come out with an engine. So during the 1990s and the, the first part of this century, SNS was the supplier of engines to these aftermarket companies. And most of them actually went through and got uh, Department of Transportation certification. So they were actually vehicle manufacturers. But uh, we called them custom OEs because they kind of looked like a custom Harley Davidson. Okay? Uh, they hated the term that was applied to them, it was Harley clone. That's, that's one reason that we actually developed a proprietary engine just for them. But let's, let's look at some of these. Here's our KN series engine, it looks like a knucklehead. This is our P series engine, it looks like a Harley Davidson panhead. This is the SH series engine, it looks like a Harley Davidson shovelhead. This is a V-series engine, which would look like a, and, and fit in actually, a, in an evolution frame. This is kind of a special V-series engine. This is a 145 cubic inch engine. Um, back in 2003, Harley had their 100th anniversary. We had our 45th. So we said, well, that's 145. If you add it up, let's build a 145 cubic inch engine to commemorate that. And, and that was our, our promotional deal for that year. This is another V-series engine. You can see we've got our own oil filters and everything on here. This would fit in a Sportster frame. And this is the T-series engine, which would fit in the current big twins with twin cam engines. And we've just come out with a super huge 143 cubic inch engine that fits in a stock frame. Now that's, that's some engineering uh, to make that big a motor that'll fit in the stock frame. So that's, that's good stuff. Here's our 160 cubic inch NHRA Pro Stock engine. That was the engine that's in that rattle trap bike. There are about 35 of these out in the world. They, they cost about $35,000 a copy. And we have about 10 teams running these things and they all have two or three engines because racing be, being what it is, if you have to break your motor to win a race, you'll do it. Now I had mentioned that um, SNS built a proprietary engine for the custom OE market. But that's an idea that actually went back a long way. If you look right here, these are some castings that George J. Smith had made in the late 70s, not too long before his untimely death. These are engine parts. This was going to be a four cylinder motorcycle engine. The, the dream of having a proprietary SNS motor goes back that far. Unfortunately, uh, he passed away uh, and that project was never finished. But in 2007, we came out with the X-Wedge engine. Now this X-Wedge engine here is made out of plastic. All these parts are plastic. We have a rapid prototype machine. We can create a part in the computer as a 3D model. We put it into this machine and it actually builds a part in plastic. It's dimensionally accurate. So we can bolt this thing together. Obviously it's plastic so we can't run it. Uh, so, but here's an entire engine built out of plastic parts. So we know everything's going to fit. This bike contains the first running X-Wedge engine. And one thing about our rapid prototype machine is we can also make, <coughs> excuse me, we can make parts out of wax. And if we make them out of wax, we can send it to an investment cast company and they can make aluminum parts. And all the aluminum parts in this engine were made that way. It's a very expensive way to make an engine. This thing cost us somewhere in the neighborhood of $30,000 to build. It's not economical, but it took years off of this project. And that's worth 
more than that, way more than that. So we have some very cutting edge technology. Um, that's how we can stay on top of this business. It's very competitive, but s and Cycle has never been afraid to spend money on technology because that's what's going to keep you on top. You can see some, some different pictures of motorcycles here with the X-Wedge motor. Here, here was a promotional one we did for Mobile One. Uh, Jay Leno got this bike and he was supposed to try it out and it was supposed to be sold at auction, but he ended up keeping it. He liked it so well. Here's a couple of other bikes uh, that had this motor in it. Problem was, this thing came out in 2007. In 2008, we had the big market implosion and all these custom OE motorcycle companies disappeared. So here we had this wonderful motor and no one to buy it because it was specifically designed for the custom OE market because they wanted something a little different from a Harley motor, but not too different to alienate the, the, that market. Um, eventually, this company here, Morgan, out of England, started using our x wedge engine in their three-wheel car called a Morgan 3. And we've sold thousands of motors to these people. Uh, these are now available in the United States. They're, they're a real gas to drive um, because they're about this tall and they go really fast. So it's a lot of fun. That's what the whole thing is about. It's fun. You know, nobody's making you drive a motorcycle. You do it because it's fun. And the faster you can go, the more fun it is. That's where we come in. This is kind of an outgrowth of the, the market crash in 2008. Uh, we were selling engines to everybody and his brother at that time, but engines are very expensive. And people were replacing their stock Harley-Davidson engines with s and engines. But once the money got really, really tight and you couldn't get loans, that type of thing, uh, we started to focus on other types of performance products that were more affordable. And we developed the four-step product, a process actually. Uh, we, most people that buy a Harley-Davidson, the first thing they do is put on a performance exhaust to make it louder or to make it go a little faster. But so we had, we had mufflers for several years before that, but we really pushed on our, our exhaust program. So we have different slip-on mufflers. These are tuned headers that we offer. And of course, we have all these different intakes. Just uh, changing your intake and exhaust system, you can pick up 10 horsepower. That's about the cheapest 10 horsepower you're ever going to get. And it doesn't take that much because most people can install this stuff themselves. So it's very inexpensive to buy. It's inexpensive to install. Now, changing an engine or putting a kit in your engine, that takes a little bit of, uh, you have to know what you're doing, you have to have the right equipment. Uh, the average guy can't do that. You know, there are some consumers who are above average and can, but most of the time they're going to have to take it to a shop and it will cost them some additional money beyond what the parts cost. So we have exhaust, that's step one, different types of exhaust. Step two would be camshafts. So you've got the intake, you put a, you install a set of camshafts in your bike, okay? That's gonna pick up even more horsepower. And for those who are even more power hungry, we have big board kits. Now these things bolt right on. Uh, you don't have to take the engine out of the bike. You just take your stock cylinders out, bolt these on, and you've increased your, your displacement. Uh, if you have an 88 cubic inch engine, you'll end up with 97 cubic inches. If you have a 96 cubic inch engine, and these are all standard Harley engines, you could have 106 cubic inches. It's, it's very simple. It's not as easy as bolting on an air cleaner, but it's not very expensive because you don't have to do any machining and um, it can be done in an afternoon in, in, a, in a motor shop. So it's not a hard thing to do. Then of course, for the real power junkies, we have CNC ported cylinder heads. People send their, their cylinder heads in here. We put them on our five axis CNC machine. Uh, we modify the ports, the combustion chamber, and you pick up a whole bunch more horsepower. But of course, if you're doing that to get more air in and out of your engine, you're gonna have to have a bigger throttle body. Now this is our throttle hog. This, is a, this one happens to be a 66 millimeter throttle body. The stock ones are about 50. We have one that's bigger than this, a 70 millimeter that we use on the T143 engine that we talked about. That engine makes about 160 horsepower at the rear wheel. A stock Harley makes about 75, 80. 
So if you double the horsepower, chances are you're going to go a little faster. The people that buy us in this product um, cover quite a wide spectrum. There's the guy who owns a Harley. He wants it to go faster. He puts some of our parts in it, maybe some cams or a big bore kit or something like that to make it go faster. We sell complete engines as well, which you could put in a Harley Davidson motorcycle, or let's say you want to build a motorcycle from the ground up. You can buy a frame from various manufacturers, buy our engine, buy all sorts of things, wheels, gas tanks, transmissions. Uh, you can build a, an entire custom motorcycle. And that, of course, was the basis of the, the OE boom in the 1990s and early part of this century. Uh, people were building motorcycles. Well. That isn't as much the case nowadays because the economy is still a little weak for that. People are doing it, but not on the scale that they did. So we are concentrating more on our core market, which is upgrading Harley-Davidson motorcycles. One of the things about s and is when people work here, they stay here because it's a good company to work for. And, and we recognize some of these people that have been here more than 25 years. Every air cleaner you see on the wall represents an employee who has worked here for 25 years or more. And you see the gold one in the middle, and that's Dan Kinsey. He's been here over 40 years. We're in the SNS manufacturing facility here in Biola, and we're in the warehouse. Now, this is a, a raw material warehouse. We don't ship parts to customers out of here. This is just the store castings, forgings, and other things that we're going to machine and build into uh, the parts that we sell or possibly into a complete engine. When parts are done, we'll actually ship them up to La Crosse to our distribution center. And that's where actually we'll, sh we'll ship things out to customers from there. We're actually in the middle of a big cleanup, so this area here kind of looks pretty barren. Well, this is where we put all the stuff that we're getting rid of. So let's head on into the uh, engine assembly room here. See, this is the engine assembly room, and our entire plant is kind of built around this room. It feeds parts in here. When they make parts, they're either going to come in here to be assembled as engines, or they're going to be packaged and they're going to go up to La Crosse to be sold as actual parts. Now, we have some pretty high-tech machinery in here. This machine over here is a dynamic flywheel balancer. It actually will put a flywheel in there and say what kind of pistons we want to balance to, push the button, and it takes care of it all and it's, it's very, very accurate. We do two types of flywheels in here. We have uh, pressed together flywheels, which is what these big hydraulic presses do here, press these things together. And we have the old traditional bolt together flywheels, the five piece cranks as they call them, where the stuff is actually bolted together. And then of course, once they're put together, they have to be trued. Now one of the things that I mentioned being a blueprinted engine, we won't send a flywheel assembly out of here that has more than one half thousandths run out on the main shafts. Currently, Harley Davidson spec is 12 thousandths. That's a big difference. Now, this is the engine assembly line. This is where we actually build engines. And you can see we have uh, a full crew here working today making engines. We still sell quite a few engines. It's not like it was in the, uh, the uh, latter part of the last century and right after the turn of the century, we were building engines for a lot of OE customers. We're building that back up, but it's, it's taking time. But we still make engines and still, people still buy them because they're the best. Okay, this is an important item here. This is the end of line testing machine here. Every engine we build, Every engine that we sell goes through this. It's a computerized test. We have a very powerful electric motor that actually turns these motors up to about 3,000 RPM. We feed hot oil into them so it simulates a running engine. And there are electronic sensors hooked up to this thing so we can, um, we can test cylinder pressure. We can test uh, crankcase pressure, uh, vacuum in the crankcase actually, pressure in the cam chest, oil flow, all, all sorts of things on this thing. So we know that when somebody bolts this engine into a frame, they're not going to have a problem with it because, boy, does that make them mad. And we don't want that to happen. You can imagine going through all the trouble of building a motorcycle or installing an engine and then finding you have a problem with it. It just isn't good, you know. And SNS is known for quality or known for performance. So we just don't want to have that problem. So we take this extra step of actually testing every engine we build. So let's go out on the plant floor. 
Okay, the SNS plant is set up in what we call cell-based manufacturing. Each cell does a specific job, and it'll start with a raw material, like these flywheel forgings here. They're kind of unattractive, but these things are closed die forgings. They're heat treated, which, which is why they're dark and are making my hands all dirty, because that's iron oxide. Once they're machined, however, they look like a piece of jewelry, because everything we do is very precision machined, and it looks really good too. Even though that's going to be an engine and nobody's going to see it, people really like to think that they've got something special. So we're going to start with that forging there. By the time it gets through this cell, it's either going to go into the engine assembly room or it's going to be in a box ready to ship to a customer. Okay, this is our, our camshaft manufacturing area. And those big pieces of steel are going to end up just like that camshaft that you can see right there. And you can see there's an awful lot of material that's taken away. But that's how these things are made. And it's one of the things that we do here in SNS. We actually make our own camshafts. Uh, in the past, we had another ma manufacturer do the camshafts, but they also sold cams in the market. And having a competitor being a vendor is kind of like letting the goat watch the cabbage patch. Obviously, they're going to uh, tend to their own needs first. And if they run out of parts, guess who's not going to get their shipment of camshafts? And if we don't have camshafts, it doesn't mean, okay, okay, you're out of cams, no big deal. Well, no, we're out of engines. We're out of engine kits. It, it can be really, really serious to be out of one part because it takes all those parts to make an engine run. What you see behind me here is the Palatec line. This is the thing that got us in trouble in 2009 because this thing replaced a whole lot of obsolete machinery. And the way this thing works, as you can see there's a, a cart down here that actually will go on this side of the aisle and pick up tooling, bring it over here, Operator fills it with parts, and it'll take that same tooling and take it to one of four machining centers on this line. Okay, this thing can run 24 hours a day uh, unattended, if, as long as it's got parts in it, and it's very, very intelligent. If it's machining a bunch of parts on one of these machining centers, let's say uh, tool breaks, it'll actually take that job, move it down to the next machining center, and finish off the parts. It, it's very, very high-tech. It, it actually checks the parts dimensionally, and every time it changes a tool, it checks those tools to make, the, make sure that they're good too. Because these things do wear out, and it has to compensate for the tool wear to get a, a part that is dimensionally correct. And of course, that's very important to us. We actually have several programmers on site, you know, that they actually um, program what these machines will do. And the thing about NC machines is they will do anything you tell them. That's totally flexible manufacturing, depending on the tooling that you put in it. Uh, you can make them do just about anything. These, if you're a motor guy, you look at these things and you say, hey, that's not a Harley crankcase. Well, no, these are Kawasaki uh, lawnmower crankcases. It's one of the things that we do with our um, custom machining, our manufacturing services. We machine these lawnmower crankcases for Kawasaki. These are used in the big zero turning radius lawnmowers that you'll see at uh, Farm and Fleet or wherever you happen to go. Um, it's just a machining job to us. We know how to machine crankcases. We know how to hone cylinders. This is just another job for us and it helps to pay the light bill. You know, we, we keep the doors open any way we can. This is one of our garages here in the R&D department. We have our Morgan car here that uh, we mentioned in the museum with our X-Wedge engine in it. We have helped the Morgan company uh, work on their powertrain uh, because this engine is so powerful that it was breaking things and they had to come up with a way to build a, a, a powertrain that could handle the stress that this engine could give on it. 
Uh, it's very powerful, but it, the other thing is it's a V-twin engine. It's two big cylinders that go boom, 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 and it, the torque spikes are enormous whenever one of those cylinders hits. Whereas if you have an eight-cylinder engine, it's very smooth. So um, you can you can get away with a little little less stout uh, drivetrain in that in that case. Now this bike here, this bike is called the Dragon 143. We built this as a promotion for our T143 engine. We're going to be taking this down to uh, Kentucky, Bowling Green, Kentucky, to the drag races down there. We're going to do some exhibition runs. We'll see what this thing can actually do on the drag strip. So it's going to be a lot of fun. That's what this industry is all about, is fun. We're in the R&D garage here at SNS Cycle. Now, you'll see there's a whole lot of late model motorcycles here, Harley Davidson, Indian, different bikes. Uh, Every year, SNS has to buy a bunch of new motorcycles simply to take them apart and see what's in them. Because we don't get a memo from the manufacturer saying, oh, by the way, we changed this and you're going to have to do that to make your parts fit. They don't actually want us to know this stuff. So we have to buy the bikes, take them apart, see what they've changed, and see how we have to change our parts so that we can continue to supply our uh, performance parts for these late model motorcycles. Okay, this is a, what we call a dyno room. This is a chassis dynamometer in here. And uh, proven performance is the SNS logo. And one of the way we prove things is to put these motorcycles on a dyno, see how much power, how much horsepower, and torque that they make. Um, this is a, a key tool. We can take a stock motorcycle, we can run it on a dyno, see what kind of power it makes, see what kind of performance it has. Maybe we can put our parts on it and run it again. And we can say, okay, we improved this by so many percent or this many horsepower. And this is, this is an electronic file that is generated. Uh, we can print these things out. We can compare these things. Uh, it's all statistical. It's very, very, uh, very high tech. You know, the fact that we can prove that what we make actually works. And here's a, a local company that employs a lot of people here in the area. Uh, we are internationally known. Uh, it's something that a lot of people around here don't know about because if you're not into Harley-Davidson motorcycles, chances are you've never heard of us. But we are eminent in this field and uh, if you talk to Harley people, they're going to know who we are. More local spotlights air weekdays at noon and weekends at 4 p.m., all on this community channel 14.